The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. We are, uh, as I said, in the middle of breaking busy. And I have talked to so many people who uh, feel like this is a perfect time of year, January, of course, where you're trying to figure out how to get through the rest of a cold winter and reset priorities for the new year, who have said this is kind of exactly what I need right now. And uh, so if you are, are in that place where, you know what, maybe you're humming along okay, but you also recognize that life is getting busier and, and you want to figure out how to make sure that, that, that it just doesn't push you off track with your goals and your, your sense of joy and purpose in life, um, this, this is for you. But, I, but I've been careful to say this series is, is for me. I'm, I'm kind of preaching to myself here because I, I feel very much a part of a, of a busy world and uh, it's meant for me as much as it is any, anyone else. So it's not like a secret attempt to get volunteers or get people to give more. It's really, uh, it hits home for me and I hope it does for you too. In your bulletin, you can track along sermon notes. If you grabbed a bulletin on your way in, um, there's kind of a, a blanks and some space where you can kind of write down some things that you pick up today. But a quick review as we get started here. We have talked as we've been through this series that, that change in our world takes place on two environments. It takes place on the physical environment, and it takes place on the cognitive environment. So as, as companies create more products and more social networking engines allow more multiplication on a physical and a cognitive level of knowledge and possessions, it causes pain on three other environments of human life, social, emotional, spiritual, as we try to keep up with the physical and cognitive change, which is exponential, we fall behind and we neglect other areas, and it causes pain and anxiety and stress in our lives. Another uh, visual we've been using is we have a limit to how much we can tolerate, how much we can invest, and that limit changes as you age, as you face illness, as you face just different schedules of life. Uh, th that the limit is, is not fixed, so you have to kind of reflect every different point in your life. Where am I at, and how much can I tolerate and handle? But most of us in this culture live on overload, so instead of having some nice, that yellow space, that banana-shaped space where it's called margin, we live on overload without margin. And when you live on overload, you experience that pain that was on the prior slide that leads to exhaustion, fatigue, and burnout. Margin is defined as limit minus load. And it's very important for me to acknowledge that I am created by God, not to be God, but to be a finite creature who relies on God. And when I do that, I have to admit that I require margin, and that I have limits. And it's the human rejection of limits that gets us into so many problems. Uh, so we, last week we talked about getting an exit strategy from that, that overload place. We need an exit strategy back to a place where we have space for life to happen. So we have a space for, for emotional availability to our families, so that we have space to, to deal with a fire that comes up at work or at home without feeling like that pushes us over the edge and that any interruption is overkill. So we, we talked last week about some specific steps, four specific steps you can take um, for margin. We've been backed up a little bit on our messages, but we will be posting all of the messages from this series um, early this week, so you can catch up if you've missed any of those. Uh, I, I was playing, uh, how many know who the, what this game is? It's one of the best, and I'm proud to say as many cool things as we got our kids for Christmas, this was the one gift that they have been, you know, really consistently playing with. You know how kids sometimes just play with the box of a really expensive gift that they get, of course. And, but they, they have loved this low-tech, no-screen gift called Battleship. Problem is, my son has, it doesn't matter how I explain the rules, he makes up his own. So I'm playing Battleship with my son, and this game can take an hour or more. And in this case, we were like 90 minutes in, and the, the goal is you, know, you guess on the top of that screen there, you guess where their ships are. And if you hit the ship, you guess, guess the quadrant, quadrant, and you guess the ship, you, they say hit, and you put a red dot. And then you try to guess where the rest of the ship is. You, you know how to play this, right? Okay, yeah. I'm sure there's, a, there's also an electronic version for really high-tech people. We just got the, 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 the dumb version. But um, my son lied the whole time. So we're playing, and he's like, miss, white. And that was where I was actually hit. And then uh, sometimes he'd say, hit, and he'd say, you sunk my boat. So I wouldn't 
shoot any more at his belt. And so I get 90 minutes in, and I'm like, I, I have no more space. Did you, did you not put your ships on the map? Oh, yeah, they're there somewhere. I'm like, well, 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 why am I not hitting anything? Well, I'm just not telling you. <laughs> I got so doggone mad at him. This is a waste of 90 minutes of life that I'll never get back. But for him, he thought the goal of the game was to just outwit your opponent, you know? Like, I'm not giving you, I'm not telling you where my ships are. Like, no general tells the opposing army, like, hey, here's our boat, shoot it, right? So, like, why would I tell you where my ships are? And so we had this, like, adult-child argument, and I'm trying to reason with him, like, that that's not how the game should be played. And he's telling me, like, you know, this is how battle, there's all is fair in love and war. And, he, and so uh, we just had a stalemate. I just quit, and I stormed out as, with a tantrum. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not playing with you anymore. The problem was... And this happens to us on non-humorous levels, too. This happens to us uh, when you have a new job. This happens to us when you're in a relationship. If you are not on the same page with the mission, with the, the boundaries, rules, goals, and the mission of what we're doing, what we're trying to do, you just kind of feel like you're wasting time. Like, you can know how to do a given job. You can have the right job description. But if there's politics and, and there's, like, all kinds of backstories to how to get things done in your organization, you feel like you don't, you're, you're, you're not actually accomplishing anything. And only when you kind of understand together, we're on the same page, here's how we operate, here's what the goal is, can you actually feel like, okay, this is time well spent and we're making progress. Whether that's in life or in games, you, you kind of have to have a shared sense of mission and a shared sense of getting there. Because all of us can wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and just see someone that you don't recognize. We can wake up in the mirror, brush our teeth, wipe the toothpaste off, because it's always a messy job, and then just take a minute and say, why am I here? What's the point? Sometimes we wake up, oftentimes in our culture, we wake up with, with butterflies in our stomach, heart pounding as we think about the day. Grab the phone, first thing you do is check your messages. I've heard wisdom, don't check your messages for an hour. Give yourself space to be a human being who is not called to accomplish something or communicate with people digitally the moment you open your eyes. Because that isn't why I'm here. I'm not here as a product to crank out output. And I struggle with that. Every morning I grab my phone and I have this battle, like, the, like my hand just wants to grab it and start doing something to be productive. And I, I battle to remind myself, I am not just created to be productive. I am also created to have a father and a relationship with a father and to re be reminded that I am his child as I go about my day. So it's a battle for me to make margin to remind myself why I am here. What's my mission for being here? Or another way to think about it is, is if you would write a mission statement for your life, what would it be? A lot of corporations have mission statements. Most of them are terrible. Have you ever been to one of those retreats where you have to like say what our mission statement is and you just kind of have a, a floating brainstorming session and you wander all over and add words like, uh, like you know, solutions and other things that just are fancy buzzwords in corporate America but don't really, really mean anything. I'm not saying a, a useless one, but if you would have one for your life, what would it be? I encourage you to take some time. We're going to come back to this next week. This week to think about what would my mission statement be? And if I showed it to my family, they'd say that's spot on. That's not what it just is, but what, what it should be. Jesus, in a sense, has given us a mission statement. And we're going to look back at Scripture at a moment where he kind of sent his followers out with a temporary mission and to see how that really changed how they operated. And it's going to inform, I'm hoping, how you feel like your mission statement is refined this week too. Luke chapter 10, one of our favorite Scriptures as a church, we, we love Luke 10 here, and you're going to find out why in a minute. Jesus is, is just telling stories and, 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 and doing miracles, and he's, he's, he's into his ministry and his, his career of like public ministry. And now he has this moment where he's like, I just, it just can't all rely on one person. I have to multiply. And so he just takes a group of people and he sends them out in his name, as he still does today. So after this, the Lord Jesus appointed 72 others. You thought the disciples were just 12. There were dozens and dozens of disciples, a large crowd. He had a couple, like two, three followers that he really hung out with intensely. He had a group of 12, and then he had a larger crowd of 72, and then a whole crowd beyond that that followed him. 
So this was the 72. 72 others, and he sent them two by two. He does, he does not send us out alone. If you try to be an individual Christian, if you try to read your Bible, pray on your own, go through life on your own, and have a bunch of friends that don't share your faith and don't do life with you, I guarantee you, you are not optimizing your relationship with God because your relationship with God is meant to be informed by a circle of people who you can be accountable to. Pride often prevents accountability, especially in us men. About people who you can be vulnerable to, vulnerability can prevent a lot of issues that, that would otherwise be natural to my sinful nature from bubbling up and causing problems. People know my issues, pray for my problems, listen to what I'm struggling with. So he sends them two by two, not just to get twice as much done, but so that there's support, vulnerability, and accountability. And he sent them ahead to every town and place in which he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Luke 10, 2. We pray every week here, at t every day as a church at 10.02 that God would send us the laborers that he has planned to reach people for Christ in, in his loving name. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Luke 10.2. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't take a purse or bag or sandals and don't greet anyone on the road. He's sending them out to be vulnerable, to rely on the hospitality of strangers as they seek to share the gospel. Two things so far that emerge as what we're trying to do uh, as a church. First of all, he sends them out together. We have in our church, and you'll notice on the back of your connect cards, we have DNA groups that are meant to be that sort of two-by-two two sending. It's a group of three people, in our case, that, that try to meet every week and hang out, talk, pray through some specific pieces so that they can find support and accountability for the journey that God calls us to, the mission that he calls us to. We're also transitioning towards missional communities as a church that as we mobilize more and more, we're going to identify specific causes in the community that God wants us to engage so that we can band together to do ridiculous good and creatively bless people in this city. That's our version of trying to do what Jesus is describing here in community. And we're also, as we said, set an alarm every day at 10.02. And if you want to join us, please do, if you haven't yet, to pray Luke 10.2. God, send us laborers for this great plan that you have for our city. So we're trying to pay attention. Then he goes on. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Now, this is a blueprint for how to engage people in a life of faith on the go. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it'll return to you. So the first is go out and somehow speak peace to people who don't know God. In a world that people are suspicious of God or suspicious of God's followers, go out and speak peace. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Don't move around from house to house, but when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what's offered to you. So he's asking them to, to, to engage in interrelying inter inter relationships with their people that they come in contact with. So my neighbor, one time we had um, Cashwise Foods deliver food. You ever tried that? It's kind of slick. You know, you don't go shopping. You have them delivered. Well, we weren't home when they came. So they knock on our neighbor's door. We have all this frozen food. Can we borrow your fridge for your neighbors? And I say, sure. And we're not just in our neighborhood to help our neighbors. We're thankful for darn good neighbors. And we rely on each other to keep an eye on our homes, to, 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 to be a blessing. And in this case, they blessed us first. And so we kind of owe our neighbors one. And Jesus says, accept hospitality from people. Rely on them. Get in real relationships. As Christians, our job is not to just dump out what we know into people's lives. Our job is not to do a brain dump, not to just tell people how to live, but to actually have real relationships where we share, where we support each other, and where we get to know each other's stories. He says, don't move around because I want you to actually engage and get to know people. Really, really get to know people and rely on one another. And as that happens, look at verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. See, something happens when you get in real relationships with people. This formula kind of summarizes the paragraph that we led. First of all, he says, um, how do you operate in a culture that maybe is, is spiraling away from God? Represent God by just creating goodwill. I love going to the community um, and just like... Being friendly to people and kind and um, getting to know the bank tellers and getting to know your, your, your baristas at your coffee shops and actually trying to form, taking the time and making the time to form actual relationships. Because when those actual relationships are formed, this cool exchange happens 
where they come to you and say, my daughter is sick. I have an appointment at the uh, neurosurgeon. My grandmother's in the hospital. My coworker is dying. I've had this cold that has been there for four weeks. I've got this awful rash. Let me show you. No, I won't show you. I said, the relationship will get there. Just give it time. And when that happens, now you have an opportunity to represent a really good God. You can say, you know what? I'll pray for you. Is that okay if I pray for you? Well, I don't really believe in prayer. That's okay. I do. <laughs> and then when God answers that prayer, he loves answering those prayers. You go back and say, how was your throat? I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. The bank teller that I, I try to work with every time I go to the bank always just getting to know her and, and just hearing how things are going and, and just asking about her life. And eventually she just shared something really personal about an issue she was having with her esophagus. And, and I said, is it okay if I pray for you? And I won't pray here because I know you probably can't do that at work, but my, my family and I will pray for you. She said, thank you. Thank you so much. And when you're at the point where you can't eat or, or drink anything, you'll take prayer. <laughs> Next week I went back. How's your throat? We've been praying. She said, my throat is better. Thank you so much for praying for me. And all of a sudden, God showed up. The disciples were sent out in community to build relationships, in community to, to, to spread goodwill, to speak peace. Our job is not to go out into Bismarck, Mandan, Lincoln and be grumpy. There are way, way, way too many grumpy Christians who think they know it all, who think their job is to do a brain dump of rules. God wants us to go out and speak peace to represent a God who died to bring about peace, not just to give us more rules. He wants us to honor the, 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 the standards that are befitting of his followers, of course, but he wants us to go out there representing a God who chose grace and spread goodwill everywhere we go because that opens up relationships, and as we allow ourselves to experience the back and forth of human relationships and be vulnerable and care about people's felt needs and offer to pray for them, we're going to have opportunities to speak about the kingdom. On our lighthouse map over here, that's exactly what these tax have been committed to do. You look how many tax we have there. This is amazing. We said, if you want to be a lighthouse, grab a little slip of paper next on the chair there, grab a tack, put it where you live, and then just start praying for your neighbors. Start doing Luke 10. Just start praying for them. And then, and then when, however you can, just start building relationships, connect with them, gather together with them, and eventually you're going to have an opportunity to pray for felt needs. And when you do, God's going to show up in a cool way. And as more and more people get that vision, we're going to just have these hubs of grace all over Bismarck, Mandan, all over Lincoln, where God just pulses through us. It's just really a cool visual to see exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He sends us out together as households to do exactly that. And that's why we've been talking so much about uh, the Passions Audit on our website. Because it's one thing to say, in general, I get what Jesus is saying in Luke 10 too. I get what he's saying about these four steps. I get what he's saying about being a lighthouse in your neighborhood. But there's also a specific mission that you have that's different from the person next to you. There's a specific way that God has called you to operate in this community that, that relates to the very specific things that break your heart about what's happening in our city. You might be just really struggling when you look at the crime pages and the newspaper online and just see the crime. You might really struggle when you hear about hunger. You might get really frustrated when you hear about kids going to school without warm clothes in the wintertime. You might be really frustrated when you think about all the unchurched people in our city. You might be really frustrated when you think about uh, teen pregnancy. You might be really frustrated when you think about foster kids in our city that, that are just looking for stability and joy and purpose. And as you take this passions audit on this specific link, it's going to cue you to write those things down, to check those things off. And what we're going to do is we're going to gather kind of the, the, the surveys together and identify our community feels called by God to engage these three, four, five specific causes in our city. And then we're going to collect together and organize around those causes. So Jesus says, operate on the go in these four ways to bless your city. But then I want, to know, I want you to sense also that specific passion, that specific mission that he's put on your life so that we can gather as a community specifically around those and make a difference.
So I hope you can do that this week, and then we'll be sharing the results in the near future. There's a story kind of where this happens that I kind of want to conclude with today, and this story is the Good Samaritan. I'm sure you've heard about the Good Samaritan. We're going to take a layer deeper uh, of, a, of a journey through this story as we close, just to kind of see what Jesus is talking about. This is the very next thing that happens after he gives them this mission. There's a snotty religious punk that comes up to him and tries to justify himself. Likes his respect in the community, likes his standing in the community. He wants Jesus to kind of validate how awesome he is. And so he says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. So he's trying to outsmart the Son of God. Bad idea, right? Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's testing Jesus, also wanting to get props in front of everyone listening because He's got an I am awesome t-shirt on, right? Jesus plays this game. What is written in the law? You're an expert in the law. I'm sure you know. He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God. And I imagine him speaking with a snotty, sniveling voice. I'm sure he didn't, but I just I hear his voice this way because he's kind of portrayed as a little bit of a, of a punk. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. I've memorized that since I was a boy. I am awesome. You've answered correctly. Jesus replied, do that and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself. Something's missing and maybe it's just being validated as awesome. Something was missing and his pride wasn't filling the hole. He just needed some, some kind of affirmation, and, and he wasn't getting it just by pretending to follow all the letters of the law and be, be, be elite religiously. And so he says, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus does what Jesus does. He doesn't give him a direct answer. He tells a story. If you, ever kids, if, you, if you have kids and they come up to you and say, can I have a cookie, and you tell them a story, it's going to bug the living daylights out of them. I don't know if people liked when Jesus said, they're taking a cookie. There was once a boy whose teeth were rotting. <laughs> Jesus does this. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from, to, from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So here's a guy bloody, beaten, and naked on the side of a road in the middle of nowhere. A priest... Oh, you think, lucky day. A guy who knows God is coming. Because if someone knows God and knows how merciful and kind God is, um, well, this guy's saved. He's not going to die. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. You see, there are rules about whether you could touch a man who's bleeding or dying or dead. And if you follow the letter of the rule you, and you're a priest, then you can't go and do something else religiously because you have to purify yourself. And so the priest thought about himself and his own rules first. He was too busy. He was too holy. So too, a Levite, another religious member of the elite religious class, when he came to the same place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So it's not just, I'm pretending to not see you, it's I am going out of my way to avoid the issues in your life. I don't have space, I don't have time, I don't have margin, I don't have compassion, I don't have interest, I don't have a mission that is focused on spreading the grace of God wherever God puts me. I have other plans, and I even think they're God's plans. Jesus is talking to one of these religious experts who's missing the point. And believe me, so far the man's starting to sweat. His toga has sweat rings at this very moment. He's saying, if you live this life, you've got it all worked out for yourself. You've got every corner filled of your page. You're too full for the mission that God has planned for you. But a Samaritan... And the moment he mentioned Samaritan, everybody threw up in their mouth. Because <laughs> people hated Samaritans. They were half-breeds. People who used to be Jews who intermarried with other pagan races and engaged their gods. People hated the Samaritans. They would walk all the way around Samaria to go from one side of Israel to another. Hated them. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil 
on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. Jesus finishes a story, doesn't even transition, doesn't say the moral, looks square in the eyes of this self-righteous, way too busy religious person and says, which of these two, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? And as the story continues, the man can't even say the guy's race. He can't say the Samaritan. He just says the man who showed him mercy. Go and do likewise, Jesus says. See, mission happens in the margins. Only the Samaritan had enough emotional margin to look at a man who's dying and not see his own schedule book, but actually a man who needs help. Do you walk through life with emotional margin for the needs of other people? Mission happens in that margin. He had time. The other guys had to get somewhere. We can book our schedules so packed that we simply say, God, I am already doing what I think you want me to do. I cannot be available for anything different, but God often has interruptions planned for us. Do you walk around with time margin? This man took out his oil and took out his wine, which I guess if you're dying, wine isn't going to hurt, right? I mean, in the oil, of course, to heal his wounds and, and bandage him up. And he's like, you know what? Here you go. I've got plenty to share. Do you go through life with Margin of supply. Are you maxed out? Struggling with debt? Many are. That's okay. But do you have an exit plan to get to a point where you can live with margin again? The Samaritan did. See, this story is actually not just about a guy Jesus was trying to teach a lesson. The story is about you. The story is about me. This is meant to guide our course of life. You see, we have a Savior who was walking down the road of life and he saw you and I beaten and bloodied and alone. He saw people passing by us not caring. He saw life's options not fulfilling us and he stopped and he, he became a human being and he came to us and he poured himself out for us to heal our wounds, to heal our diseases, to forgive our sins and he put us back in his father's family and he brought us back into the, 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 the kingdom of God and he says, when I come back, I'm going to come for you. The story's about us. And it's also about the life he has planned for us. This $49 in my pocket is a perfect example. So I, Donovan, would you raise your hand back there? Just say hi to Donovan. There he is. There's Donovan. Donovan, on his spare time on the weekends, drive, drives a cab. Last night, Donovan was driving a cab, and he picked up a gentleman who asked Donovan to take him to a hotel. And as Donovan is driving, he doesn't just do his job. He turns the radio on to a Christian music station so that the people in his car would, would hear the, maybe some good news. So he does what he's already doing with enough margin to allow his work to also be a blessing to someone who's working or, or, or operating with him. The man in this car started breaking down, Donovan told me this morning, crying. He admitted that he was on his way to a hotel room to buy meth with this money, these $49. I'm not sure how much meth it buys, maybe just enough to get another hit, another high. But he heard the words of the song that we're going to sing as we end the service today. It talked about the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is now alive and active in us. When we pray and ask this God for help, the same power goes into action as the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And he wondered, is that, is that possible? Is that possible for me? Donovan said, yes, it's possible. And he said, then take this money and give it to a church that can make that possible, that, that would do the kingdom work. Take me home. I don't want to go to, to buy drugs. He, of course, like a good soldier, Donovan invited him to church, but he had to work today. Hopefully we'll, we'll have him here. The same power that takes a meth addict 
and stirs him awake and takes him to put his drug money in an offering plate. It's the same power that we are talking about when you try to fight for space in your life to be on mission for God. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that's at work in us as we seek to follow him, to make space for him, and to make a difference for him. The same power that Jesus used to heal people is available to you as you call for healing in your own life and seek to be a blessing in the people's lives around you. Would you stand and pray with me as we sing? I'm going to invite the band up. We're just going to go right to our closing song. The very same song that was playing in that taxi cab last night we're going to end with today as we celebrate the power of a God who changes lives. And this is going in the offering plate, I promise, Donovan. I'm not going to, to out to eat after church. Let's pray. <laughs> Jesus Thank you for this $49 in my hand right now. Thank you that you rose from the dead, not to end something, but to begin something. So that when we seek life change, when we seek to make a difference in the world around us, when we seek to be on a track of life that is life-giving to us and life-giving to others, thank you that your power is available to us. And there's nothing that any of us are facing that is too strong for you that is too great for you to overcome and that can be in the way for your kingdom as it just overflows through us, God. Bless us as we sing about your power and as we live it out this week. In Jesus' name, amen.